This episode was sponsored by Girls Can Crate, a subscription box inspiring girls to believe that they can be and do anything. Real women make the best heroes, and every month they deliver them to your front door. Hi, Olivia. Hi, Katie. Today, I want you to harness your imagination. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Ready? Imagine this. It's the 1680s, Bath, England. Ooh. And it's a walled city. It's got a medieval wall all the way around it. And it's got an impressive Gothic cathedral right in the middle. Which is my favorite. Yeah. Bath Abbey. So, surrounding Bath Abbey, there are little alleys and winding streets all around. The city is, it still has its medieval infrastructure. So, there's no sewers, there's no plumbing, there are no landfills. So, when you have to throw stuff out, like all stuff, I mean, all stuff. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, I, yes, say, yes I know. <laughs> okay. Stuff. Yes. It, stuff, stuff that happens. <laughs> There's no plumbing. All the stuff <laughs> goes out the window into the streets. So the streets are are just full of thick layers of stuff. <laughs> yes. <laughs> By our standards, it's a rank and filthy world. Here, walk through the streets of Bath with me. This is my modern recording of Bath that I took a couple weeks ago. We're walking through the main square right in front of Bath Abbey. The square is just full of people from all walks of life, just like it always has been. These are the sounds of Bath that have remained constant for centuries. But there, there's a piece missing here. There's a piece missing of the soundscape, something that would have been very present in the 1680s. And we rarely hear this sound today in America. In Europe, it's, it's still common enough, but this would have been a daily occurrence in the 1600s. It's street cries. These are the, the sales calls of people who are selling their wares. It's pretty cool. I actually studied street cries in some depth for my dissertation. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so each individual seller, they would have had an individual melody, a distinct melody that they would always wow. sing so that you could, you'd recognize it. You could even hear them from far away. You'd recognize the tune before you would be able to make out the sound, the words they were saying. Wow. And you could be like, oh, so there's my beef pie man or whatever wow yeah so they have a very distinct tune and you would hear those cries in the streets over and over all the time wow so i have recruited some folks and attempted to recreate this soundscape oh cool so without further ado 17th century bath Green goose breeze. 
We are homing in on one particular street cry. Hmm. Can you hear her? That woman in a cap, a little bonnet, and very simple garb. That woman is selling delicious smelling fresh baked buns. Possibly the only nice smelling thing in town. <laughs> Smart marketing. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you about her today and take you to her house, the oldest house in Bath. Wow. I'm Katie Nelson. And I'm Olivia Mickle. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. Sally Lunn is an enigma. She's a legend. And it's so rare to have any history of plain working class folk this far in the past. You know, we know that they existed, obviously, that they did things. <laughs> we can talk about them in general, but it's hard to talk about a specific person because they just don't show up in their records. There's little hard evidence at all of her and anyone else, any other working class person in this time period. So to try to uncover their stories, we rely on archaeology, um, folk legends, probability. Some people say that Sally Lunn never existed. Oh, <laughs> the Sally Lunn bun is famous. But some people surmise that the name Sally Lunn Bunn is just an anglicized version of the French name for a particular loaf of bread. I disagree, probably. <laughs> There's lots of other alternate theories that explain where the Sally Lunn Bunn came from, assuming that she didn't exist. But I dug into this really deep. <laughs> I went pretty deep. And, and it's fascinating to me, but probably not so fascinating to everybody else. <laughs> so I'll spare our audience going into depth here, but what I will say is, as a historian, based on all the extant evidence and understanding the values and the pitfalls of oral tradition, I personally believe that it's very possible that Sally Lunn really existed. <laughs> and if she did, then this is most likely her story. <laughs> so I went to the Sally Lunn house in Bath. It's a restaurant and a museum. And I met with Simon Lloyd Williams. Yep, my name's Simon, general manager of Sally Lunn's in Bath. Let me take you around the house with me. First, the basement. So we're going down to the museum now. Again, just watch your heads coming down here. Wow. wow. So this is pretty much where it all began. Down here. It smells like. We've just had a fresh delivery bread. of buns. We get fresh delivery every morning in. We bake them, bake them fresh every morning at about four o'clock. It smells really good. It's. Can you describe where we are? So we're right <laughs> down, sort of in the cellar at the moment, of what would have been. And um, when, well, when Sally Lum was baking here, this would have been street level. So you can see the oh. stalactites and stalactites underneath there, and that's actually underneath the road where we came in. That's amazing. Oh, cool. so this is where they have their museum set up. Uh, you can see the oven in the wall there, and the coolest part of it is that as you look, you can actually look out underneath this street in front of the Sally Lunn house. They have removed the wall there and made glass. Oh, cool. So you're actually peering underneath the street outside. And what you're looking at through the glass is the medieval street. Oh, cool. And there's like stalactites hanging down from the, what now wow. is the ceiling. It's very cool. So you have a real sense of the passage of time. You know, you're descending into the ground yeah. back in time. But the big thing to see there is the oven itself, because this is where she baked all of her bread. And this is the, it's the original oven? Yes. And it's amazingly wow. intact and really cool to see. Wow. So when I say oven, you say Polo. 
<laughs> when I say oven, Sally, Len! <laughs> when I say oven, don't picture a modern oven. If you can picture maybe more like a pizza oven, that's more what I'm talking about. This oven she was using, it dates to the 1100s. Wow. It's pretty crazy. It was, it's the type of oven that has been used mm -hmm. since ancient Roman times. It's pretty amazing. In the history of cooking, ovens looked pretty much the same from ancient Rome all the way up to the Industrial Revolution around 1800. Wow. <laughs> so for that whole span of time, an oven was an oven. And the way it works is it's a cavernous space in the wall. Right. So there's this door about at shoulder height. You open it up. And you fill this cavernous space full of tightly bound sticks. Right. You light them on fire and close it up. You let those burn up. Uh, it's going to take a few hours at least. Yeah. Then open it up and scrape all the ashes out, pull everything out. And then you can put your food into that hot space to bake things. It's called a faggot oven. <laughs> Unfortunate. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tightly bound sticks are called faggots. Yeah. So this oven in the Sally Lunn house is just around the corner from the abbey, from the cathedral. So historians surmise that it must have belonged to the abbey. So we think that this, this building actually fed the abbey. So they would have been baking and cooking for the monks in the abbey oh. at one stage. Quite incredible for just a chance find, isn't it? Yes, indeed. So this potentially has been a bakery for... Since four, since years. yes, yeah, for a thousand years, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. So presumably that is the same oven. A thousand years ago, it was the oven for the monastery. By Sally Lenz's time, the monastery is gone. The cathedral's still there, and now it's a commercial bakery. <laughs> And then Sally Lunn was baking here in about 16, about 1680. Okay. Do we know anything about where she came from? So Sally Lunn was a Huguenot refugee oh. who um, fled persecution from France, came over here, started living in Bath, working in Bath. When she, when she came over, she was apparently Solange Lyon, didn't she? The locals struggled, struggled oh. with her name. So they were the ones who changed it to Sally Lunn. And she was a baker, and a good one. She was baking the, the same bun as we sell today, a soft, sort of brioche-style bun that could be served either sweet or with savoury toppings. And she, she came over here, and she was actually selling it on the streets and, and baking here, huh. out of this kitchen. And they became legendary. I mean, it's mentioned in a few novels. <laughs> So how did they find this? Like, how did they know to look for it? It's really sheer luck. It's kind of an amazing story. Nobody knew that all this stuff was under the ground. In the 1930s, a baker owned the Sally Lunn house <laughs> by chance. But uh, that level, the basement level, it, it was buried. Right. They, they didn't know it was there. So he wants to dig out a cellar. He's an archaeologist by hobby, <laughs> and he starts digging in his basement. <laughs> <laughs> that's not chance. That's fate. I know. That's the ghost <laughs> of Sally Lund. Totally. <laughs> so he's puttering around in his cellar, and he's just looking at the dirt floor, but he notices patterns that other people wouldn't notice. He thinks, hmm, this is a thing. That's like cocaine for an archaeology nerd. He's like, there's things in my basement. <laughs> there's something in my own house. <laughs> and then imagine his surprise when he starts excavating and uncovers an oven wow. in his own basement. So cool. Wow. And he knew what he was looking at. Other people might not right. recognize it, but he did. They would think it was a brick vault or something. Not yeah. A but wait, there's more. <laughs> and then down here, we go, um, you can actually see remains of the Roman wall. Really? <laughs> they also discovered Roman foundations underneath the medieval oh. level of the house. So if you go down even deeper, you see Roman structures. 
Ooh. underneath the house. So they were excavating okay. and they found this, purely by chance, knocked through and found this. It wasn't sort of <laughs> just by chance that he knocked through and... That's amazing. And found the different street levels. So he's putting the puzzle pieces together. He's excavating his house. He goes, well, there's a giant oven here and here it is on Roman foundations. This surely must be the refectory oven. This must be the oven that fed the monks. Right. But then he's also putting two and two together. He, he's living in Bath in the 1930s when the legend of Sally Lunn is alive and well. The Sally Lunn bun by the 1930s is famous. Like across the Western world, everybody knows the Sally Lunn bun. Hmm. And they know that it's from Bath. So he, his thought process is ovens are not a dime a dozen. They don't right. just pop up all over a city. So if Sally Lunn was baking the Sally Lunn bun in Bath, she was baking it in that oven. So he called it the Sally Lunn house. But could they prove that Sally Lunn lived there? I think that maybe was his next tantalizing challenge. Right. Well, how could we link this house directly to the Sally Lunn? Well, since like no evidence of Sally Lunn really right. exists, what are you going to do? But he set about restoring the house, not just down in the basement, but it's a, it's a three-story house four stories if you count the basement. So he set about restoring it. And so they were, you know, uncovering the original walls and restoring the woodwork. They were uncovering fireplaces. And then ah, they made a discovery. So we've, I'll show you when we go upstairs, there was um, her recipe was actually found in one of the alcoves up there. Oh, really? Yeah. That's amazing. So can you show me upstairs? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, please follow me. Just again, again, watch your head everywhere. Okay. We're going up this uh, spiral stone staircase up from the basement. Now to the old wood floors. This is beautifully restored. Uh, we've got hand painted wallpaper here with uh, guy Adam Kalkin, which he's, he's done all himself, which is beautiful. Oh, he hand painted. It's all hand painted. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, he's a very, very talented man. Right. And then if we come into all the, this is the ground floor room. They're all, all the rooms are differently, differently themed. And so this is the room where the recipe was found. Okay, so now we've stepped so into this back room. There's a little fireplace here in the wall. And above the fireplace is, that's the alcove. Ah. Where the recipe was found. In the wall? In the wall, in behind the alcove. So the alcove's now been removed. In the wood paneling above the fireplace, ooh, ooh, ooh. they found a recipe. <laughs> and they've been using that recipe ever since. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, this is my new favorite story. Did it say like Sally Lunn on it? The recipe yes. said Sally Lunn bun? Written in her handwriting. Holy cow! Yeah. <laughs> the exact okay. recipe that we follow now. Ah. Yeah, the recipe hasn't changed since 1682 when wonderful. Sally Lunn was baking here. It's the same recipe we stick to. <laughs> we keep it very secret. So can, like, we still have this recipe? Can we see a picture of this recipe? Well, no. No, oh, you man. can't see it. How dare you? Oh, yeah, it's a secret recipe. It's a <laughs> secret <laughs> recipe. <laughs> that's the trouble. And that's ah. what I kind of like about this. That is the bit of evidence that proves this is Sally Lunn's house. Right, and no one can see it. Nobody can see it. But you can go and see the alcove where they found it. <laughs> they have it lit up and highlighted. You can go to the fireplace and go, oh, there's the spot. Very clever. This. Yes, yes, it's brilliant. Let's pause to thank our sponsor, Girls Can Crate. Sally Ride said, you cannot be what you cannot see. And Girls Can Crate believes that the more girls learn about real women who did fearless things and made the world better, it will inspire them to believe in themselves and their own potential to make the world better too. You know, I think we keep saying this, but these are so cool. I mean, these are so much cooler than I thought they were going to be. Plus, they just launched something that I think is pretty cool. It's a mini crate. It's a smaller and more affordable version of the big monthly crates. So if you're looking for something that's a little bit cheaper, that's the thing for you. Use the coupon code HERNAME, all one word, to get 20% off your first month's crate. Go to girlscancrate, C-R-A-T-E, 
www.thepeacekeepers.com. All right, so we can't see the secret recipe that may or may not exist. Right. How, what What are these? Why are these so famous? What Are they just bread? So it's, let's talk about the Sally Lund bun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's uh, a brioche style bun that's oh. humongous. Avid bakers will probably already have some idea of what the Sally Lund bun is. Um, for those who haven't heard of it, the brioche style bread it means basically you have regular bread dough and you add a bunch of eggs and you add a bunch of butter. It's, there's just so much more to this than plain old bread. And I don't think you can describe it. You just have to taste it. It's sort of this magic. These are it here. These are it. I'm happy to bake one off for you now, but they are, oh, yeah, wow. about six inches round. Yeah, wow. Fluff up and our sort of brioche, brioche style buns. Um, so can you give me any hints about your recipe or is it 100%? So the recipe itself is, it is very, very similar to a brioche. Okay. So it's, it's, it can be served either sweet or savory. What we do, we cut the, the, the large buns in half mm -hmm. and we toast them. And it really comes alive when it's toasted. Ah. We butter it and uh, then we serve it with either sweet or savory toppings. We've got lemon curd, cinnamon, all sorts of really sort of delicious sweet toppings. Mm. Probably our most famous is the cinnamon. Oh really? Um, try one. We like well. You just have breakfast, just have breakfast, don't you? But yeah, I'd like to try one. Try one. Would you? Yeah, yeah. We'll, yes. get, we'll get one on. It's historic. Something sweet or savory? Oh, what's your favorite? I like the rabbit actually. We do a really nice oh. Welsh rabbit. Wow. Would Would you mind tasting one, or we can taste one to record it and describing like what it tastes like? Yeah. What now? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Should we Could get one? You? Do, do Let's do it. Sweet and a savory done now. If I get a sweet one on first, because I'll be quicker. Okay. We can Let's get it do done that. and. That sounds great. Again, heads, heads everywhere. Yeah. I love the exposed beams and wood floors. And then into here. Chrissy, can you do us a, a cinnamon bun, please? We, we, I can tell you what's there. That's the Jane Austen floor. So we sort of themed it around about around Jane Austen. Oh. Oh, so this is the Jane Austen room. This, this is, is Jane lovely. Room. There's a chandelier hanging from this ancient beam in the ceiling and beautiful light blue wallpaper. Wow, it's really wonderful. So when guests arrive, do you say, which room would you like, Jane Austen? We tend to try and fit him in, but sort of on a Saturday, it might be full over, we're normally sort of three, full over three floors on a Saturday. Oh. But everyone's got their own favorite, favorite room. People, some people prefer up here, some people prefer on the ground floor, some on first floor. Mm. What's, what's your favorite out of all well, of them? I would take any of them. They're all beautiful. It's, it's, a, it's a special place, it really is. Yeah. So. so I got, this is the best part of this tour. <laughs> I got to taste when. So Chrissy's just preparing a cinnamon bun. Thank you, Chrissy. Oh yeah, it's gone. Are already there? Wow. That is really beautiful. So this is the cinnamon bun. This is the cinnamon one. Yeah. And this is just half of a salad bun. That's half of one. Yeah. Wow. That so we is what we beautiful. tend to do is we, we uh, cut it in half, toast it, and we've got the bottom and the top. We tend to serve the um, the savory items on the bottom and the sweet items on the top. Ah. So the the recipe for the bun itself is secret. It's secret. But on top is this just cinnamon and sugar? So it's cinnamon. Toasted? It's a cinnamon butter. Oh. Wonderful. Okay, would you would you mind tasting it? With Let me, me taste it. Yeah. Sure. It's I really good. Taste. It's really good. Mm. Oh, it's soft. A little bit crispy on the outside. Wow. So we just sort of just brown off the cinnamon, melt it into the bun. It was a nice breakfast. It looks amazing. That is really, really good. I've never tasted anything like that. That's brilliant. It's like the best cinnamon toast on planet Earth. It's good. It is the best cinnamon, cinnamon yeah. bun. Now I want to eat the whole thing, even though I'm You can eat the whole thing. Breakfast. Freshly made every, sing every single morning. We uh, make them in the evening. They'd have to prove overnight. I say we, I, I can't take the credit for it. We've got a, a baker, Christian. And Christian is uh, a very, very passionate man. Mm. He's, um, 
incredible guy. Really, really loves what he does and takes a lot of pride and care. Cookbooks from this era survive. Mm. So the oldest printed recipe is from a cookbook in the 1700s. So... You know, you could Google Sally Lund bun recipe and come oh, up with yeah. probably 20 modern different versions. Ooh, so we can make these. Yeah. Yeah. I actually literally have some Sally Lund dough rising in my kitchen right now. <laughs> As I was getting ready for this episode, I just got really hungry. I was going to say, I'm, I'm, that's, I'm going to go do that as soon as we're done because I'm hungry now. <laughs> So this, these cookbooks are maybe one way to find out about what Sally Lund might have been like. Mm. So I have this, this cookbook here, a, a antique British cookbook called Markham's Country Contentments. It was widely used in the 1600s and also in America around 1700. And at the beginning, it lists the personality requirements of a good cook. Mm. So I think this is maybe as close as we can get to a description of her character because <laughs> she was a good cook. Right. Okay, so here's what the cookbook says. First, she must be cleanly, both in body and garments. She must have a quick eye, a curious nose, a perfect taste, and a ready ear. <laughs> she must not be butterfingered, Sweet-toothed nor faint-hearted. <laughs> For the first, being butterfingered, will let everything fall. The second, being sweet-toothed, will consume what it should increase. <laughs> and the last, being faint-hearted, will lose time with too much niceness. Uh, wow. <laughs> so this paints a picture of somebody who's sharp, bold, not too nice, not clumsy. <laughs> and if anything can tell us what she was like... That's as close as we can get. <laughs> See, that's my problem is that I am the sweet tooth and I eat half of the chocolate chips while cooking them <laughs> and then have to open another package and then have to eat half of that right. package because you can't right. just leave it sitting there. <laughs> what I love about this story is that the only historical artifact that really gives this refugee a place in history is the bread itself. So basically, this is the record we have of Sally Lund. Herself. This is it. This bun. Yeah. I mean, that's proof enough, isn't it? Yeah. That's... For any doubters. <laughs> this is how she appears in the historical record, in the form of... Of a giant cinnamon bun. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah, I doubt I'll be remembered in, uh, in that minute, what, four years, 400 years' time? Yeah, me neither. And it's also kind of... I, I like that Britain got this kind of culinary gift because of religious tolerance. Yes. Because refugees like Sally Lund were coming here from other places and being accepted and yeah, yeah I mean when you, you when go. you bring bread like that yeah <laughs> then you're very welcome yeah <laughs> wonderful well thank you very much no, thank you Simon. very much both of you for coming in pleasure uh, pleasure if, to meet you both if any of our uh, listeners ever are in or near Bath I highly recommend stopping in and getting a sweet and a savory a sweet and a savoury. We actually just started doing pies as well. So come and try a pie. Oh, really? Really good pies. Yeah. Really? What kind? We've got beef, lamb, sausage. We've got amazing sandwich farm sausage pie. We've got mushroom pie. Wow. Wow. I love that. I thought you might. That's very archaeological, too. That, you know, so much of our archaeology knowledge is centered around food rituals and food growing and you know food is the artifact that you end up with yeah and interest in historical cooking is booming right now and i think it's fascinating it's like a new way to experience the past you can actually smell and taste the past no i, I don't think it's an accident that most cultures most important sort of ritual events are around food you know if you ask someone what do you eat at christmas Everyone has an answer. It, it's not, you know, nobody's like, I don't know. Everyone has a thing that you eat at Christmas. Yeah, I think food is at the center of what it means to be human. You mm. know, it's it's such an innate primal drive, you know, must get food. But it also, yeah. it brings people together. It's also visually beautiful, you know, it's art. Yeah. And you can smell it, you can feel it, you can taste it. Yeah. It's, it, it seems to be at the core of who we are.
If you want to try a Sally Lund bun, find the recipe on our website, whatshernamepodcast.com. Or, good news, the Sally Lund House is looking to launch a bun by mail program. So if you're interested in that, then visit sallylunds.co.uk. On our website, you'll also find lots of other pictures and links, including more information about the evidence and debate surrounding the history of the bun and the possible existence of Sally Lunn if you want to dig deeper. Thanks to Simon and Helen at the Sally Lunn House in Bath. Music for this episode was performed on the viol by Dr. Philip Serna, who runs the nonprofit Viols in Our Schools, aiming to bring early music to wider audiences. And our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for lots of additional pictures and content. What's Her Name podcast is produced by Katie Nelson and Olivia Mickle. And What's Her Name is funded in part by listeners like you, who went to our website, whatshernamepodcast.com, and clicked on Donate. Thank you.